Welcome to the podcast of Leeds First Methodist Church. We are so glad you decided to tune in with us today. The following sermon was preached by David Dockery, and it is the second sermon in our church's How to Receive God's Promises series. If you would like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so by visiting our website at leadsfirst.org, and at the top of the page, go to Worship and click Online Worship. Well, good morning. Uh, as Chris said, my name is David Dockery, and it's my joy to get to share with you uh, from God's Word this morning. Uh, my wife, Megan, and I have been members here at Leeds First Methodist Church for a year, a year and one week, actually. Uh, and uh, it's just been a joy to be a part of this church, and we're so glad to be here with you. Well, today we're continuing our series on how to receive God's promises. And we're looking at this theme passage, this theme verse from Joshua 1.9. It reads, this is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Last week, Pastor Chris's message looked at how we receive the promises of God by breaking through the barriers in our lives that can keep us from claiming those promises. Well, this week, as we're speaking of promises, I'd love to be able to tell you that this is going to be the funniest, quickest, and most interesting sermon you've ever heard. Unfortunately, I am trying to stop making promises that I can't keep, and so this may not be that. But... Have you ever been on the bad side of a bad promise? Or maybe you've made a few bad, fake promises. I can think of one time uh, when I was on the receiving end of a bad promise. I had just started uh, a job, a summer job, right after high school, right before I started college, and I was working in a sandwich shop. And remember in that interview, the owner was so excited to hire me because the school I was going to was in the town where he was opening his second shop, his second store. He was like, look, we can hire you here, we'll train you, we'll get you ready so that when we open the new store, we can promote you to a shift manager and we can have you train new employees and all that. Oh, and by the way, there'll be a a pay rise too. Um, So that was pretty exciting, you know, 18 years old about to be 19, thinking that career advancement is right on the cusp. Well, I do my first semester. They're finishing opening the store. They open it. They call me to come in and start working. And night after night, I find that there's no training of employees. There's no talk about becoming a shift manager or shift leader. No, instead, I'm in the back scrubbing dishes. They bring me out so I can clean off the tables and mop and sweep the floors and clean the bathrooms, take out the trash. I thought maybe, maybe, just maybe, it was a Mr. Miyagi Karate Kid sort of uh, training regimen they had for me. But I can say four years later, after four years of working at the same place, no discussion of advancement ever came. Maybe you've had people promise you something similar, like a promotion at work or a great new job that ended up being just the same as the old job. Or maybe, maybe it was a promise of a, a setup for a date. Or maybe it was um, an investment plan that ended up being more of a scam than a plan. Or maybe it was someone promised you a gift or a special trip for your anniversary or your birthday, and you've yet to see that package arrive or you've yet to see those plane tickets purchased. Well, today we're going to look at a story in the book of Joshua where God kept his promises. It took many years to accomplish. In fact, for years, his people weren't so sure that those promises were going to come true. But through the course of generations, God kept his promise. And in this particular story, in response to God's fulfillment of promises, his people make a new promise. So if you'll turn with me to Joshua 24, 
starting in verse 1, we'll see what happens. Now, if you have a Bible app, you can navigate to Joshua 24. You can follow along on the screens, or you can even uh, use the uh, text link that you were sent if you texted here. So, Joshua 24, starting in verse 1. Then Joshua summoned all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, including their elders, leaders, judges, and officers. So they came and presented themselves to God. Joshua said to the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. But I took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him to the land of Canaan. Then we'll skip down to verse 14. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve God, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Well, the people replied, We would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes. As we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is our God. Then Joshua warned the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy and jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you even though he has been so good to you. The people answered Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. You are witness to your decision, Joshua said. You have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, they replied, we are witnesses to what we have said. All right then, Joshua said, destroy the idols among you and turn your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God, and we will obey him alone. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day at Shechem, committing them to follow the decrees and regulations of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, Thanks be to God. Well, can you imagine the setting? All the tribes, all the families and clans of the nation are gathered together. They're hearing their history, much of which many of them saw firsthand or heard from, from their parents or grandparents who saw it happen. They're surrounded by this good land. They're surrounded by a fulfilled promise. The Lord has done it. He has brought them into the promised land. They are part of the fulfillment of the promises God made to Abraham. They are home. They are back in the land that Abraham was promised by God centuries before. And they are no longer living in tents, living in cities. They're no longer traveling through the desert. They are no longer living as slaves in a foreign land. And consider how Joshua feels in this moment. His life has been a long life. He has seen from the time that Israel was in Egypt as a slave. Joshua lived in Egypt as a slave. Joshua sees the end of the story too. He has traveled through the wilderness. He's traveled through the desert with Israel. 
He has seen God's action every step of the way. He's seen God releasing them from the captivity of Israel, I mean, of Egypt, through the plagues. He saw the water of the Nile turn to blood. He saw the frogs and the locusts that God put upon Egypt. He was there for that first Passover. He may have been even painting the blood upon blood of a lamb upon the doorpost of his family's home. He traveled through the sea with water on both sides. He saw how God parted those waters so Egypt so the Israelites could escape from Egypt. He saw manna. He tasted the manna in the wilderness that God provided for his children. He tasted the water that came from a rock that Moses struck with his staff. He saw every action of God's provision and salvation for the people. And then years later, he saw the land as a spy. He gave a report to Moses. He said, it's a good land. Its produce is incredible. Its people are mighty, but we know what God can do. He got us out of Egypt. He has defeated all these enemies along the way. He can take care of the Canaanites in this land. But that's not what the other spies said. Only one other spy, Caleb, shared the same view as Joshua. The other said, no, we need to retreat. We can't take this land. They are too strong. And so God punished them to wander in the desert for 40 years. But for the next 40 years, Joshua saw how God preserved his people even in their punishment. He saw God bring victory in an impossible situation again and again and again. So now, years after the Israelites began to take possession of the promised land, Joshua and all the nation are gathered together to remember God's promises. You know, the Lord didn't just promise to be a real estate agent and deliver on a promise of land and a new home. No, God promised to be their God. He promised that they could become his people. But if they failed to keep covenant, if they failed to keep their side of the arrangement, their end of the contract, then they would forfeit his promises. Considering all that God had done, all that they had seen God do, what would cause that sort of disloyalty? Simply put, a failure to leave the fakes at the door as they entered their promised home. Falling for the fake promises of security and protection and satisfaction from the idols, the fake gods of the Canaanites, Moabites, or Egyptians. I think it's probably safe to say no one in this room is trusting in the gods of the Canaanites, Moabites, or Egyptians to deal with their problems today. But I do think we do have a tendency to be tempted by and to listen to false promises, fall for the fake things, not just from someone trying to get us to sign on the dotted line of a dodgy contract for a broken down car for a bad deal, but bigger lies and fake promises, things that look like the pursuit of something that promises to numb our pain, to bring us joy, or to keep us safe. This might look like trying to gain more and more wealth so we can be financially secure no matter what situation might arise. It might look like putting our hopes in political solutions and politicians. Maybe it's in seeking the newest and the best so we can keep up with the neighbors next door. These lies and false promises can look innocent, like a, well, I'll just do it myself mentality, or impressive, like the pull yourself up by your bootstraps American dream. Or it can look toxic, like a, I'm better than, we're better than them mentality that leads to racism and prejudice. It can be the whispered lies of finding solutions or comfort and addictions. And really, it's just as simple, it's just as simple as setting our hearts toward anything that promises the easy way to happiness, safety, 
protection, or satisfaction, rather than setting our heart toward what God has promised us. So what does it look like to leave behind the fakes you and I are prone to listen to? The first thing we need to do to leave behind the fakes is to remember who acts on your behalf. So if you're doing the sermon handout, that's our first fill in the blank. Leave behind the fakes, remember who acts on your behalf. So think back. Remember, who has been on your side? Who has been with you? For the Israelites gathered with Joshua, it was always the Lord. The section that we skipped from verse 13, uh, from verse 3 to verse 13, is full of action. But who is the subject of that action? Each of those cases, it's the Lord. The passage recounts God stating, I took, I led, I gave, I sent, I brought, I did, I destroyed, I gave, I did not listen, I rescued, I gave, I sent, I gave. Throughout the passage, there are 20, 20 instances of God acting in this short summary of, G- of Israel's history. And how many times did the idols and the false gods of Egypt, the Canaanites, pull through for Israel? The answer is zero. None. It was all God's action. It was all God's grace on their behalf. I suspect that the same is true for us. When we take a moment to reflect, to think back on our lives, we can ask ourselves, where have the fakes kept their promises? When has the promise payout actually measured up? And in addiction, where has the substance been anything more than a substitute for restored relationships, lasting peace, or genuine hope? When have the false gods of things, convenience, nationalism, etc., ever actually produced real life transformation for us? The truth is that the only one who acts for us is God. In what ways has he acted on your behalf? In your own life, where have you seen him lead, give, send, bring, do, rescue? Where has he destroyed the temptation in your life, where has he, where has he taken you through a tough circumstance, through the valley? When has he not listened to all the terrible voices in your own head or from others, the accusations, the lies, and brought you out whole? How has he restored relationships, brought lasting peace, genuine hope, or real transformation for you. Now, I realize that there may be some of you for whom you can't can't think of how God has acted on your behalf, where it's difficult to think of a time where God has been on your side. You may feel as though you are stuck and God is not listening or God does not care. If that is you, if you feel that today, then I would invite you, I would urge you to speak with someone today about how we can come alongside you and pray with you and walk with you in your time of uncertainty and doubt as you're going through that valley. Now, look back with me at verse 14 and verse 15. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Now that Joshua has repeated how God has acted on Israel's behalf up to this moment, he directs them to make a choice. Leave behind the fakes and choose today who you will serve, and choose daily who you will serve. That's the second fill in the blank if you're following along. Number two, leave behind the fakes, choose daily who you will serve. So we need to keep making that choice 
day after day? Who or what are you going to make the priority each day of your life? Following Jesus is not just a, I'll follow you today, let's evaluate again tomorrow. No, following requires a choice that requires daily follow through. And not just lip service, not just compliance with the rules and regulations, but commitment. God's desire, like we said, wasn't simply to be Israel's real estate agent and deliver on land, but that he intended to be their God and for Israel to be his people. He was calling for them to be in a commitment-based relationship with him, not just a contract. And now through his son, Jesus, he calls you and I, even though this story hasn't really been about us, as folks who don't share in the Jewish heritage. But the invitation is to join his family, the church. Through Jesus, we can become his people as we choose him as our God. In the gospel accounts, when Jesus calls someone to follow, He calls them to drop everything and follow him. He calls for a choice followed by commitment. And he calls the same for us today. Maybe you've made a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you made it years and years ago, decades even. How have you been making that decision daily since then? Are you choosing Jesus on Sundays, but not the other six days of the week? Do you struggle with consistency or complacency in choosing Jesus? And maybe you made your decision to follow Jesus more recently, and you're just trying to learn how to choose Jesus when tempted by the fakes. Make today the day to renew that commitment and begin that renewal by choosing Jesus today. And maybe you have never stopped to consider who you will serve. Maybe you've never chosen Jesus. Perhaps today you would say, I've been chasing fake promises all my life. Well, hear this. Today can be the day that you choose to end that chase and make the choice to follow Jesus. And if that's you, simply start with a confession. Confess to God that you have been choosing to serve something or someone else first. And then confess that you choose to serve Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Put your faith and trust in him, no longer in yourself, no longer in the fake promises of this world. Well, as you leave behind the fakes, by remembering who has acted on your behalf, and then choose daily who you will serve, remember God's promises by following together with wholehearted faith. That's our third fill in the blank. Leave behind the fakes. Embrace God's promises by following together with wholehearted faith. Look back with me at verse 18 and then verse 24. Verse 18. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord for he alone is our God. And then 24. The people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God. We will obey him alone. The people have responded. They have made their choice. They recognize that God has kept their promises, and they choose to follow God alone. They have declared that they will follow God only, that they will not be following alone. Notice that they respond with the words, we and our, in both verses. This decision to follow requires an individual choice. But we follow God best when we are in a community of followers. Your decision to follow Jesus is your decision. But taking that decision a step further and uniting with fellow believers provides accountability, encouragement, and fellowship that helps us on our way. By choosing to serve God, to follow Jesus together, we can then embrace God's promises together. And there's something interesting I want to note in verse 19. As Joshua tells the gathered people, you can't keep this promise. The people respond, we will keep it. 
I don't know if you have flipped the next couple of pages and read any of the book of Judges, which follows Joshua. But when you read through the book of Judges, you know that Joshua was right. They could not keep the promises that they made for very long. And if we're honest, neither can we. Not on our own. When we try to do it on our own, deciding for ourselves to do what is right in our own heart, our lives can look a lot like Israel in the time of Judges. But let me tell you that we are not called to keep this promise on our own. We are called into a covenant community that can help us pursue accountability with one another so that we can help one another to be the best followers that we can be. It's not just so that we can sit around and point out each other's faults. It's so that we can spur each other on. It's iron sharpens iron but so that we can submit to God's authority in our lives better. Well, after all this talk about God's promises, what has God actually promised us? What promises are we to embrace? Freedom from the fake promises of this world. Freedom from the chains of sin. Freedom to pursue, to pursue sanctification and holiness, to become more and more like Jesus. It's not just freedom to pursue holiness, but a helper, the Holy Spirit, to put us on the right road, to keep us on the right road, following in step with God every step of our lives. It's the freedom to simply trust and to do so may today be the day that you receive the freedom promised by God. Don't carry the fakes with you any further. Leave them today. And remember that God is with you acting on your behalf. Choose Jesus today and every day. Embrace the promises of God as you follow him together with this covenant community and follow him with your whole heart. The thing about freedom is that it gives you the option to choose, to choose him today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time where we can worship you, where we can learn from your word. Father God, I pray that you would help us to remember how you have been with us along the way help us as we choose you daily and that you would help us to follow together so you're going to pray amen thanks for listening to our podcast we would love for you to visit us in person at 8 45 a.m for modern worship or at 11 a.m for traditional worship if you would like to plan a visit simply text the word connect to the number 205-772-4906 and you'll be sent a link to get you started. Thanks again, and God bless.